Coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, we're talking evolution and genomics with Dr. Jonathan Eisen from UC Davis. That's up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki Science Hour with me, Dr. Kiki. Episode 55 for Monday, July 19th, 2010. Pieces of the Evolutionary Puzzle. This episode of Dr. Kiki Science Hour is brought to you by GoToAssist Express. If you're in tech support, clients rely on you for fast and reliable service. Help them the fast and easy way with GoToAssist Express. For a free 30-day trial, visit gotoassist.com forward slash kiki. Welcome, everyone, to Dr. Kiki Science Hour. It's episode 55, and we are talking today about evolution, genomics, microbes. Hmm, how do these things all go together, and do they have anything to do with you and your life? Very possibly, the answer is yes. We're going to be here for about the next 50 minutes. Sit back, relax, get ready for some learning, get ready for some science, get ready for some fun, because I am joined today by Dr. Jonathan Eisen from UC Davis and their Genome Center. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Kiki and everyone. Hello. It's so great to have you here. I've uh, been meaning to interview you for a long time, and yesterday we met up and we're talking about a fun project that we're working on together, and um, I actually had a cancellation, and I was like... <gasps> And, you know, I'm a geek, so I said yes. That's right. (laughs) Exactly. So the, the question, the question for today to get started, we have genetics. Everyone who goes through school nowadays to get biology, you learn about genetics, you learn about evolution. But what are these new terms, these terms that are thrown around so, so easily these days, the omics? Yeah. Genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, it's all, it's, I just, I mean, are we going to start, it's, it's economics, I thought, is this gen, I don't Yeah, know. that's not that where work? it came from. Um, geno- genomics is all the genetics, basically. So all of the genes inside a genome is genomics. And then everybody and their mother wants to invent another omics word. So they say proteomics to study all the proteins in an organism and metabolomics to study the metabolism of an organism and so on. So everything has an omics attached to it because <laughs> genomics is hot. Because it's hot. So that's, that's yeah. basically it. It's, it's hot right now. The terms are being coined and everybody wants to be in on it. Yeah, everybody wants to be in on it and make up really silly words. <laughs> What are you doing at the uh, at the Genome Center in at UC Davis? You're also I know you also have appointments in in other departments at the university, but um, in your work, can you can you tell us about the main focus of of your work? Yeah, what I'm interested in is how organisms invent new functions, and one sort of easy way to get at that is by studying their genomes and looking inside their genomes for what genes you can find there and how they differ from other organisms. And so I use genomic technology where we look at, in essence, the entire genetic content of an organism and try and understand how that organism was able to invent a new process that it might have. And I study this in particular in microorganisms, that is little tiny things that we can't see without a microscope. And we use the same methods that people use to study the human genome to study the genomes of these organisms. And then we use lots of computer programs to analyze those genomes and try and understand where new things come from in those genomes. Okay. Is there a a lot of, um, is there evidence of a lot of novelty? 
in, the, uh, in these microbial organisms? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the planet as a whole and ask questions about where the new activities are found, so new biochemical activities, we tend to see more of those in microorganisms than in other organisms. So basically, if you take any compound on the planet, there's some microbe that can manipulate that compound, turn it inside out, add it on to other things, eat it, live off of it, or do something with it. And so if we look at the novelty, the new functions that relate to chemical reactions, they are dominated by microorganisms. Now, microorganisms don't have the novelty that we see around the planet that readily, like big trees and furry organisms. Right. But, but they have lots of novelty inside of them. Okay, so there are, there, there's between the different species based on where they're living and, and how they're living. There's just a huge amount of novelty. Um, you mentioned, we were, we were talking yesterday, and you mentioned you work also on extremophiles. Are those a, a particularly interesting group to study, and, and why? Yeah, so there um, are a lot of organisms that are able to survive in sort of the ends of the spectrum of conditions that other organisms live in. So organisms that live at very high temperatures or very low temperatures, organisms that live at very high pH or low pH, and if they thrive in those conditions that are at the edge of where other organisms live, we call them extremophiles. They live in extreme conditions. And there are a lot of reasons why people are interested in them. Some want to get proteins, enzymes, and other uh, things from these organisms and use them in a variety of industrial processes. So a lot of detergents now for dishwashers and laundry have enzymes inside of them that came from one of these organisms. Huh. I, I don't care that much about the, the practical side of these organisms. I'm much more interested in what they can tell us about how organisms are able to adapt to very sort of harsh or extreme conditions. So we look inside their genomes and try and understand what was what enabled them to survive, say, at 105 degrees Celsius when most other organisms would not be very happy in those conditions. Right. How do you actually go about looking at, at their genomes? Um, I mean, a lot of people going through uh, basic biology over the years are familiar with petri dishes and agar, ag agar substrates and trying to take a, a, a cheek swab or, uh, you know, swab a wall and see if you can grow whatever you find there into cultures. But uh, there are lots of new techniques that people are using. Um, and I'm sure in, in yeah. you use a lot of those. Yeah. So there are basically two sort of categories of things people have done for looking at the genomes of microorganisms. The first relates to what you were saying, which is that for some organisms, we can grow them easily in the laboratory. That's called culturing. So we feed them some sort of rich food source, either liquid or on one of these little jello plates. And if we can grow them in the laboratory, we can get lots of DNA from them. And then we can use methods that read the order of the bases in that DNA. That's called sequencing. And then um, if we do a lot of that, we can read their entire genome content. And so about 15 years ago, people invented a method that basically allows them to read and put together the entire genome content of one of these microorganisms. And that's been great. We use that a lot in my laboratory for these organisms that you can study in the lab. Um, however, unfortunately, most of the microbes on the planet can't be grown in the laboratory, either because we don't know how to grow them or because they just won't grow in the conditions in the laboratory. And we need other methods to study them because we can't make, you know, massive quantities of their DNA in order to run these chemical reactions that allow us to read their genetic content. And so what people do is they go now, um, we do this too, go directly to environmental samples like a hot spring in Yellowstone or the microbes in someone's gut, and you extract DNA straight out of that sample, sort of like forensic scientists would do with blood samples. 
and then we read the genetic content of everything that was in that sample. And that's called metagenomics, just because we had to have some other omic word <laughs> to describe it. I like it. I and like so it. lots of people, myself included, are now using this method to study the vast majority of microbes that we can't study in the laboratory. By, uh, by go, go on. Oh, I was just going just gonna to ask, uh, is there part of the not being able to culture them and not actually identify them by, um, you, can, you can maybe get one or two individuals or a small amount that you can you know, get off of something that you've swabbed potentially and be able to see under a microscope but not get the huge cultures of them to be able to study. Um, is part of that potentially related to symbioses that the, that the organisms might have um, in, that, in where their natural environment is that they might rely on other organisms to survive and you just don't create that environment in the lab? Yeah, we know definitely that um, microbes that obligately depend on some other organism, such as ones that live inside the cells of another organism, those tend to be very hard to grow in isolation from the host in which they live. Um, and we think that that's because the host must be doing something communicating with the microbe or sending proteins or other chemicals in and out of the microbe that we just can't reproduce that in the laboratory. But there are also many organisms that live out in the environment, like an ocean or a lake or the soil, that probably work in some type of interaction with the other organisms around them. That's called symbiosis. If they live and interact with other organisms in a sort of permanent association. And it's probably the case that that's why we can't grow some of the organisms in the laboratory is that they just depend upon another species that is dynamic in responding to their needs. Right. And we just can't do that in the laboratory. Right. But with your methodology, you're able to, um, you can, you can still find these individuals based on their genetic signature. Right. Yeah, it's basically yeah. CSI microbiology, um, where we can learn a lot, not everything, of course, but we can learn a lot about the organisms that are in an environment by reading the instructions in their genome that, in theory, should be coding for everything that those organisms do. I mean, in general, the problem is we don't really know how to read those instructions either, so we can get the... DNA sequence information from organisms in the environment. It can tell us a lot. We can figure out what organisms are there, what types of organisms. We can make predictions about what they're able to do from a functional point of view. But we're just beginning to really learn how to make those predictions. So mm. it's kind of a, I mean, it, it's the only thing we can do in many cases. Or it's an important complement to other experimental methods, but it's not the answer to every question. Right. How do you go about like looking at the, the genetic signature, the, 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 the crucial bases that, that pop out to you and you go, aha, this is an oxygen using organism or, oh, this is obviously anaerobic. Like, is, is there anything <laughs> specific that you see now? And it just is like, oh yes, light bulb yeah. goes on. <laughs> yeah. So um, basically we've built up a set of in essence, rules that came from studies of mostly organisms that we could grow in the laboratory and mostly model organisms that, you know, lots of people study, like the bacteria E. coli mm -hmm. um, or model other organisms like yeast and Drosophila and um, mice, etc. And people have connected particular functions to particular genes in those organisms. And after, you know, in essence, the last 50 years of study, we've come up with rules that say that this type of gene um, has a conserved sequence pattern in its DNA or in the protein that is encoded by that DNA. And if you have that type of gene, it in always encodes, say, the ability to grow in the presence of oxygen. Let's just take that as an example. Or the ability to degrade, you know, some sort of dioxin or something like that. And so we have a database of this information that has been developed over the last 50 or so years. And then we search in the new data for 
genes in these organisms that are similar in their DNA or amino acid sequence to the genes that have been characterized in other organisms. Mm -hmm. And then in essence, we make predictions based upon the level of similarity we see. So in effect, it's a, a comparative process. Yeah, and you can imagine, uh, you know, if people aren't comfortable with thinking about DNA, this is in essence the same thing that someone would do with looking through fossil bones from a particular environment. Um, if you find a fossil that looks like a wing, mm -hmm. you can hypothesize that the organism probably was flying in some way. Right. And we only can do that because we know what a wing should look like. And then you find a new thing, even if it's from an organism that you didn't think could fly, if you see that it has something that looks like a wing, you make a hypothesis that it probably was able to fly. And we basically do the same thing, but we do it with similarity of the sequences of genes rather than similarity of structures of organisms. Okay. So you've, um, you've done some really interesting uh, work. You were, you, you've mentioned before that you've worked with some of the deep sea robots, Alvin and the others that have gone down to some of those deep sea vents to do some sampling to get your organisms. Um, how involved in that, uh, I mean, there are definitely other people who work the robots and control them, but how, how, what's the process? How do, you, how do you get to work with Alvin or these other deep sea robots? You lie, beg, and cheat. Um, <laughs> so basically, um, when I was an undergraduate, uh, this is what got me into microbiology. My undergraduate advisor was a woman at Harvard who studied the organisms in the bottom of the ocean. And um, I went away to graduate school. I didn't interact with her that much in graduate school, but then I went off to this place that basically pioneered the field of genome sequencing, a place called TIGER, the Institute for Genomic Research. And fortunately for me, uh, everybody at the time wanted TIGER to help them sequence the genomes of the organisms that they were studying. So we got to pick and choose what types of things we studied. And many of the people at that place at TIGER were interested in pathogens. TIGER sequenced the genome of the organism that causes cholera and malaria and, you know, staphylococcus and so on. And I didn't care about those organisms. What I wanted to do was study the weird things in boiling hot springs and in the bottom of the ocean. And so I, you know, in essence cheated. I was at a place that had the toys to do the genomics. So I went back to my undergraduate advisor and said, hey, can you get me involved in this deep sea stuff again. And um, we've collaborated now on multiple projects looking at the bacteria that either live inside organisms in the bottom of the ocean or live outside organisms in the bottom of the ocean. And I've even finagled my way onto some research cruises uh, pretending to be a deep sea scientist. <laughs> and, um, you know, again, because I have sort of the access to this tool to study genomes of these organisms, and I have the background in analyzing that data, and that's in high demand, just like omics words are in high demand. Um, and so I've managed to get involved in many of these projects where people are sending down Alvin or other submarines way down into the bottom of the ocean to collect samples, and we help them analyze the genomic content of the organisms in those samples. That's neat. So there's a lot of data involved in this. Um, how, how do you deal with the data? <laughs> what, I mean, what, and, and can you give us some kind of, of concept of how much data you deal with on a, when you're working with this, this stuff? Yeah, it's a changing landscape as it is in many other scientific fields. Uh, when I, first got involved in genomics in something like 1995. Uh, there were about, um, well, at, in 1995, the first genome of any organism was determined by this place, Tiger. I was not there yet. And that genome was of a bacteria called Haemophilus influenza, and it had about 2 million little bits of bases in its genome, DNA bases A, C, T, and G. And in those 2 million bits, there were about 2,000 
proteins encoded in its genome. And that seemed at the time like an unbelievable amount of data, which took us a while to figure out how to analyze. And then about, you know, two years later, there were 10 genomes. And two years after that, there were 100 genomes. And a couple of years ago, the thousandth genome was released. And in the last two or three years, there's been a change in the technology such that it's going to be about 100,000 genomes in a year or two. Um, wow. The amount of data there is, a, you know, mind-blowing, even to someone who lives and breathes it. It's, you know, uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of different protein sequences, as well as all the other parts of these organisms. And I, I still am astonished by the amount of data. And, for example, some of the new methods that people are using to read DNA sequences from organisms, it seems like it's going to be more cost-effective to redo experiments than it is to store the data. Wow. That comes that's, from these organisms. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. To, uh, yeah, so it, actually, it, like, compl- that it, to store the data would be more expensive than actually rerunning the samples. I mean, normally, I mean, we're talking, I know from human genome stuff and gene sequencing, the, you know, it's, it's always been really expensive. I know the price has been coming down lately, but it's, it's yeah, never been cheap. You, <laughs> I can give you the price comparison. Um, if you wanted to sequence the genome of that organism that had 2 million bases, this bacterium. Yeah. When, when they first did it in 1995, it probably cost, just for the, the technical side of reading the DNA, let alone analyzing the data, it probably cost 4 or $5 million. Um, about uh, five years ago now, so 2005, it would have cost about, I don't know, $50,000 to do this for an organism like that. And right now, I mean, again, just the reading of the DNA, it's probably like $100 for an organ, a complete organism. Yeah. Um, and let alone uh, environmental samples. So there was just a paper published where people looked at the microbes that lived inside the human gut. Right. And they, they generated something like 300 um, gigabases of DNA sequence, so a hundred times the equivalent of a human genome for one paper right. in one, one little project, basically. <laughs> um, and so that's why, I mean, the, and the raw data behind that, we don't save, we can't save. So the, the way the reactions work and the machines that do this sequencing work, they basically take an image of um, some small reactions being run on pieces of DNA. That image file and the millions of image files are massive. We convert those images into data that is more useful, like A's, C's, T's, and Mm -hmm. G's. And the images certainly can't be saved for long periods of time. But even the A's, C's, T's, and G's eventually, we can barely keep up with. So the process data is already becoming overwhelming you know people are talking about farms of disk arrays yeah well i know like cloud computing is potentially becoming a a a solution for the storage of some of this data for access uh, so that researchers from you know all over the world can potentially access the same data sets to be able to do work on this stuff is that is that um accurate do you see the that kind of stuff being a place to go cloud computing is being used for the analysis of a lot of this data because you can take advantage of some of the mm-hmm. features of, you know, new compute clusters that are built in these clouds and you can share protocols with other people. Mm-hmm. But the data, we, we can't even transfer the data to the cloud. I mean, it, it's there's right. just 300 gigabases of data yeah. here <laughs> in, in one project. Right. I mean, yeah. so imagine basically, I mean, this is what happens with the big telescopes and with the linear accelerators, they, you know, spend years writing software to process the data because they can't store all of it. Um, And we're going to have to learn how to do that. Basically, we we don't know how to do it. In fact, I'm going to a meeting uh, next week to discuss this type of thing. How to Uh, deal with all the data. Yeah, and I'm, yeah. I'm not going to be the person to solve the computational part of this, but I can at least tell them which parts of the data we need 
and mm -hmm. which parts we may be okay with throwing away. Right, but um, you but how do you but do you know because maybe the technology or the questions haven't advanced far enough to know what is okay to throw away, but Yeah. But then I mean, maybe I, it'll be cheaper, so just do the experiment over again at some point. Yeah, I think you're gonna you're what's gonna happen basically is we're gonna go from pure discovery science where people mm -hmm. are just generating massive amounts of data with the expectation that you will analyze it afterwards mm -hmm. to projects where you explicitly go in with a hypothesis. You ask the hypothesis while you're analyzing the data and you throw everything else away. Right. And that's not, you know, that different than what, say, some ecologists might do going to a field site. You see a lot of things in a field site. You don't record every Everything. single thing your eyes see as you look around, you know, at the forest. You right. have a hypothesis that says, I'm interested in the, you know, some type of tree family. Mm -hmm. We're going to record something about that tree family, but we're going to ignore everything else. There's just no way that a field ecologist would be able to record everything in a community. Right. We're going to be doing that. Same thing, I think. Huh. I think that's an interesting analogy. Um, I have to take a break very quickly, but before I, I, I do, I'd love to, to hear, do you do more of your work? Do you see yourself as becoming more and more computational and more <laughs> computer-based? Or, you know, are you a biologist? A, uh, you know, uh, wh where do you fall in the spectrum of science? Yeah, I mean, I, I dream that I am still a field ecologist, field mm -hmm. biologist, um, or a laboratory biologist, but really the data is so much fun. Um, and there's so much knowledge somewhere in the data that I spend most of my time looking at data, sometimes data other people have generated. Uh, we still generate our own data with some experiments, mm -hmm. but the proportion of time that we spend in a wet laboratory, as it is called, versus on the computer right. is very low. <laughs> We're going to do more field work, hopefully, so you know I can get back out into the fun places where these extremophiles live. Um, but yeah. yeah, I'm sure. Um, yeah, as even as we get become more of a data slash information. Uh, society, and uh, as academics, maybe becomes more data rich. I don't think there will ever be, there, there will always need to be a balance between field and lab and computer and who yeah. does what, who does what, because you can't have the, the context, you lose context somewhere if you, if you only stick to models and, and data. Yeah, or, what's happening is basically, I think it's, what's happening is basically you have teams of people now where one of them is the field person, one of them is the lab person, mm -hmm. one of them is the computational person, one of them is the modeler, um, rather than in the past, because there wasn't as much data, um, people could do all of them. And I think instead, you know, there is this tendency to have more collaboration and interdisciplinary work between people as opposed to within people. Right, right. And on that note, I'm going to take a quick break to thank our sponsor. Our sponsor is GoToAssist today. And GoToAssist Express, if you are in tech support, you know, sometimes helping somebody over the phone can get to be a little bit of a nightmare. Or if you are in science and you have somebody who wants to show you something on their computer and it's just, it's just not working. You're at Princeton, they're at UC Davis, whatever it happens to be. Um, sometimes it's nice to be able to control somebody's computer over the internet. And that's what GoToAssist Express allows you to do. It allows you to, to not have to worry about um, taking time to listen to somebody else explain something over the phone so that you can tell them what their problem is when you can actually see it. You can dig through their file folders. You can go into their control panel. You can work on their computer remotely. You could drive but or fly. That would waste a lot of gas and also a lot of time. And sometimes you feel stuck and you don't have the right tool for the job. That's why you should take a look at GoToAssist Express. It's the easiest way to control and view another computer remotely. And it's pretty affordable. Really, you can do the math on it when I give you the numbers in a second. 
You can see and solve people's problems without being there in person, and you can do it quickly. You can even help customers when they are away from their computers. Or, you know, I'm sure scientists could come up with all sorts of uses for this handy software as well. Perhaps above all, it enables you to take control of a problem and solve it the way you know best, as opposed to having to deal with somebody else. You can control it remotely. So here's the offer. Try go to Assist Express free for 30 days. You go to visit go to assist.com forward slash Kiki and you get right in there. You start your sessions with just one click, just like all the services from Citrix. They make it easy. You can send the person you are helping an instant email notification. It works across platforms, so both Mac and PC. You can then share your screen and then they share yours. Uh, share your screen and they can share theirs so that you can see the same problem they are seeing. So you're looking at their screen. They can show you, tell you exactly what's going on. It includes an integrated live chat. So you can, instead of being on the phone, you can chat online. Nice and handy. And you can diagnose any problems as you access their desktop remotely. Go to Assist tells you what software is running on their machine, the operating system, programs running, security software, whatever you need to know. And then you can fix any problem that they might have by accessing the files on their computer or transferring files from your computer to theirs. And that could come in handy. You'll solve more tech support questions more quickly, solve a lot of problems actually, and help clients even when they are away from their computer. Go to Assist is brought to you by Citrix and all data exchange during your session is completely secure with end-to-end 128-bit encryption. And there's free customer service 24-7. So if you have any issues, they try and help you out very quickly. So try, try to go to go to assist.com forward slash Kiki and try it free for 30 days. See how you like it before you buy. It's a pretty good deal. Free for 30 days. You're not going to lose anything on that offer. So we'd like to thank our sponsor, Go to Assist Express, for sponsoring this hour of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Without any more, more uh, ado, let's get back to the topic of microbes, evolution, genomics. And we're talking with Dr. Jonathan Eisen from UC Davis and the Genome Science Center. I'm wondering how the, uh, if, if there was a synergy between the Human Genome Project and the technology and the advances that were made for that project and what you do now. So is there, was, were there advances in microbial genomics that helped to advance what was happening in the Human Genome Project? Um, how did, how did the, the, two, the two processes, the scientific searches, kind of uh, affect each other? Yeah, I mean, there have definitely been synergies and competition, maybe, um, all along the way. So, um, you know, people have been talking about sequencing the genome of organisms for quite a while. Once they basically started learning how to read the sequence of individual genes, I'm sure there were many people saying, why not read the entire sequence of the genome of an organism? Right. And, you know, I don't know, maybe... 25 years ago, there were serious discussions about starting a project to sequence the genome of humans or, a, you know, a model human or collection of humans or something to that effect. And there was a human genome project that was started and there were lots of discussions about this. Mm -hmm. And they basically took the approach that um, they were going to walk, in essence is what it's called, walk their way around the genome, reading one piece here and one piece there right. and slowly but carefully uh, stitch together the entire genome sequence of the, you know, 23 chromosomes from people. And um, what basically happened was a change in the, both the conceptual technology and the actual sort of real technology that people were using. And that came about in part because of sequencing of microbial genomes. So what Tiger did in 1995 was show that you could 
put together the entire genome sequence of an organism without using this careful walking method. They used a method called shotgun sequencing, where you basically take the DNA of an organism, break it up into lots of little bits, read the sequence of those little bits, and then use a computer to figure out where the bits overlap with each other and try and stitch the genome back together from assembling those little bits. This had been basically invented by someone to look at virus genomes um, many years before to look at small virus genomes, but it had never been applied to anything with a medium-sized genome before. Mm. And Tiger was able to use it for a bacterial genome, and then basically everybody would use this method for bacterial genomes. A few years later, uh, Craig Venter, who had started um, Tiger, uh, announced that he was going to try and use the same method to sequence the human genome, in essence, in competition with the publicly funded effort to slowly walk their way around the human genome. Right. And this created that whole competition, you could call it, uh, hatred, some other people might call it, <laughs> um, uh, between the what was called the public effort, um, funded mostly by the NIH, and the private effort, which was done at this company called Solera. Right. There was a real competition there for a while. It was like, who's going to do it first? Yeah. And there was all sorts of fighting going back and forth. And I, you know, saw this from the inside because I was at this other institute that Craig Venter had founded, but yeah. then left to do the Human Genome Project. Right. Wasn't there also a question because it was a, a private company that was, Craig's company was private, and is he going to keep the data open, whereas the Human Genome Project is an, was going to be open data? Yeah, there, was, thought, there, was, there was worries about, there were worries about that? There were worries about everything, about patenting <laughs> stuff, about yeah. openness. And, I mean, in, in the end, you know, the, the public project and the private project, you know, both contributed to knowledge. I think, mm -hmm. personally, I think that the public project got a nice kick in the pants by this private project to get them to move a little faster. Mm -hmm. um, there's still a debate among the people about which method was the right way to do it. Um, I, I mean, I think that clearly this random sequencing is a very important component to reading the genome of any organism. How much you can use random sequencing alone uh, depends on the organism. For humans, you know, randomly sequencing little bits from a three billion base pair genome yeah. comes with massive uh, challenges. And so in the end, they had to use other information to try and put together the full genome sequence. But it was clear that the, micro the work on microbes from a computational point of view and from a conceptual point of view, helped launch much of the work on humans. All right. Interestingly, now it's the other way around. So there's a big drive to be able to sequence a human genome very cheaply as right. part of this idea that we're going to have personal genomics. Right, that could um, lead to personalized medicine because if yeah. we know what what genes we have, then maybe we know what ge what what genetic defects or diseases we might be prone to, and hence. and you could imagine cancer cells. You would sequence the whole genome in your cancer cells to figure out what treatments might work with it, and right. you could sequence the DNA in immune system cells, which are slightly different than the rest of your genome, to figure out what you've been exposed to in your history and. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of potential uses for cheap reading of a human genome and yeah. of the genome of plants and animals, too. And so there's been this drive by a lot of mostly companies to develop methods to do this more cheaply, mostly because they think that there's money coming from the human genome point of view. And the microbial studies have benefited enormously from the reduction in cost and the increase in speed mm -hmm. that has come from these companies. So right now we're using what are called the second generation sequencing methods that came from a couple of these companies. And we're kind of drooling in anticipation for the third generation that has been announced but not yet really publicly available. That so, this, this sounds like it's some kind of parallel track to like iPhone fandom. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's the same exact type of thing because we yeah. 
You never know if we should buy one of the new machines because, you know, three weeks later, they're going to announce the next generation. It's just like buying a Mac right. um, where you worry about what's coming around the corner. Um, in the end, for many people, we're drowning in data. <laughs> Right. I mean, it's not like a new machine is going to help us because it gives us even more data right. to drown. <laughs> um, and it goes back to the question you asked before, which is, you know, you have to tie the data to experimental work, to field work, to mm -hmm. theory. And the data is just one component. And so, yeah, it's great to have cheaper and easier collection of data, just like digital photography has made all sorts of Right. Uh, characterization of the world around us easier in a way. Mm -hmm. But you still have to analyze all those digital pictures. Right. Like if someone went to a forest and took digital pictures of all the mammals in the forest, we could classify them all if we had a method to classify them all. Right. We're basically at the same point. You know, it, the data is great, but you still need methods to analyze it. You still need people to think about what it means. You still need people to sift through the results. So, yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for the new machines. They're going to be great. But, you know, we have 40 years worth of graduate student projects with the data we have. Wow. So it's, yeah. it's not like we really need any, yeah. any new projects. So you're, you are a proponent of open science. And do you think that open science is going to be the solution or part of the solution to the, uh, the data problems? That yeah, I mean, so I... I believe in sort of um, as much openness as we can have for the scientific enterprise, especially if it's paid for by tax dollars. Right. Because the, the point of doing the scientific research that's paid for by tax dollars is to spread knowledge mm -hmm. about the world that can help with, you know, disease and agriculture and environmental findings, et cetera. And so it's pretty clear that openness can help that spread faster. And the, actually a lot of the open science movement has learned lessons from what has happened with DNA sequence data over the years. There's a database called GenBank that was created many, many years ago before any genomes were available. And this GenBank was, in essence, it's data that anybody can access about DNA sequences from organisms with no restrictions in what they can do with the data. I could print out that data and sell it on the street corner if I wanted to. Right. It's completely open. Um, I mean, I wouldn't make any money doing that, but I could. People would be like, oh, what's this? <laughs> um, and, and so it, it, many people are trying to do the same thing with many other aspects of data, many aspects of the literature in science, mm. um, the software that we use, so open source and open licenses for the software. Um, there is a big movement to make all of this sort of open. And it's important to note that what we mean by open is basically both free, that is, we don't pay for it, and unrestricted, that yeah. is, you can do anything you want with it. And it's clearly benefited the field of genomics to have the data be as widely available as possible and to have the tools yeah. be as widely and openly available as possible. And I've been pushing for this, not related to your question, with the idea that it'll help um, us analyze these massive amounts of data, <laughs> but just with the notion that, you know, the more open everything is, the less we have to worry about, you know, rules for what we can do with the data sets and who we can show it to and how we can package it and how much it costs to access and the more we can just do the work. Right. But it's clear, back to your question, that this um, could be revolutionary in terms of actually analyzing the data. So these massive data sets, you know, no one's going to know how to look at them in every possible way imaginable. Right. But, you know, there's a statistician at, you know, um, University of Maryland who's invented a new way to correlate the data with pH. And there's, you know, a physicist who's invented a new time analysis algorithm somewhere in North Dakota. And there's a chemist who's written software to analyze 
predicted mm-hmm. chemical structures of things. Right. And if they all can play with the data and post to some wiki their results and share the data, the code, the results, that's how we're going to make sense out of these massive data sets. And that is what basically, you know, the physicists have been doing for a while with accelerator data, and that's what many astronomers do with Hubble telescope data. And, you know, the biologists have started to do that with the genome data, and it's clearly going to help. Yeah, it can only go only go good good places. Well, yeah. hopefully it can only go good places. <laughs> um, to take the conversation in a completely different direction, um, I was wondering about your reaction to uh, Carl Zimmer's article earlier this week in the New York Times. It was a, a fascinating article. You brought it up earlier this week, and I finally got a chance to read it. The article is about... Um, our gut microflora. So the microbes that live in our guts, the microbes that live on us, in us, that basically are more us than us. <laughs> and um, some some new techniques that doctors are, are using to potentially cure gut diseases. Um, it seems seems fascinating. I thought uh, I was I was really impressed by the the idea of what they're doing. It seems a little a little gross. When you think about it, but um, I was al- I was also told that it's not necessarily a new technique, and that this is something that's been going on for a long time. But if you could expand on that, yeah. So basically, the 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 point of that part of the article is that um, we have lots of microbes that live in and on us. We don't quite know right now um, what they're doing there. Uh, most of them are probably not doing much of anything in terms of our health. Some of them are bad for us. We tend to be really good at identifying the ones that are very bad for us. But many of them are probably good for us. And we have, you know, thousands of species that live in and on us. And as the article reported, you know, more cells of microbes than there are human cells in and on our body. And the total biological potential of those microbes is enormous. But it's also clear that when... You know, you might have an altered health state, like um, in the story there, someone had a chronic infection of this Clostridium difficile bacterium, and their hypothesis was that they had this chronic infection because they didn't have enough good microbes around to limit the chronic infection. And that many people think that this is true, that the microbes that live in and on us partly are just there to occupy the space, in essence, and keep pathogens from overrunning our system. And, you know, some of them also help us digest our food and do a variety of good things, but they may just be there to, in part, that keep out other bad things. And so, you know, they had a hypothesis that maybe introducing back into this person a microbial population from a healthy individual would help restore their health status. And so, yes, believe it or not, they did a poo transplant um, from, I think, the woman's husband. Uh, you a know, poo transplant. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, uh, well, you know, uh, since we don't know how to grow everything that lives in the environment, as we talked about before. The extreme, in, the extreme environment of the gut. I mean, can you consider uh, these, can you, can you ex- consider the organisms, the microflora in our gut, are they extremophiles? No, mostly. Yeah. I mean, in the regular part of the gut, we wouldn't classify them that way. And the ones that live in our stomach, many people classify that way because of the Because it's highly pH. acidic, right. Um, okay. But the ones that live in our gut are not necessarily extremophiles, but... Okay. We don't know how to grow organisms from normal environments either. So um, if you, and again, in the gut, if there are 10,000 species, even if we could grow a few of them, we're not going to grow 10,000. I mean, that's just going to be too hard and expensive. And within each of those species, there are variants, just like there are variants within people. We're not going to grow all the variants either. What's the easiest way to reintroduce the population? transplanted. <laughs> um, and gross as it may seem, I think, I think they're right that that's the easiest way to transplant it. And as I was, as we were talking about yesterday, many people think that this is probably why animals eat other animals' uh, poo. Um, like dogs why, or, yeah, like, or elephants. 
And thousands and thousands of species do this. Um, it's, you know, there's whole books on why they do this and documenting what the behaviors are for different organisms doing this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in retrospect, much of that behavior is probably related to colonizing with microbes. Mm -hmm. um, and just as a sort of an extension of this, you know, if you're born normally, that is your mother wasn't, uh, didn't have some placental problem, you should be sterile um, when you're born. You get colonized when you go through the birth canal by a little bit, and then you continue to get colonized through interaction with the world around you. Well, what better way to get colonized quickly if you were an animal, let's say, than to expose yourself to directly to the colonies coming yeah. from a healthy individual? <laughs> um, so, you know, it is gross um, in concept, but in practice, it's not that outrageous. And in fact, we, my lab did a study uh, published last year where we were collaborating with some surgeons doing intestinal transplants in people. And we were looking at what the microbial colonization was after these transplants. Right. And at the beginning of the study, the surgeons followed common practice, which was to sterilize the donor organs, completely clean out everything from the donor organisms, and then they would put those into people with Crohn's disease or some horrible inflammatory disease and hope that everything worked out. And by the end of by the end of the study, they were now not cleaning out the entire intestinal contents. So in essence, uh -huh. doing intestinal and through transplants with the mm -hmm. hope that the healthy microbes from the donor would help reestablish some community in the recipient. Right. That's, that's so, fascinating. So the, uh, the sterilization by sterilizing, you'd, you'd expect that those individuals that received the sterile intestines, if bacteria had anything to do with it, they probably just recolonized the same bacteria and continued to have the same problems even after the transplant operations. Yeah, that was the expectation. We yeah. didn't have enough uh, numbers to figure out whether or not there was an effect. And um, this was a multi-year project. By the end of the project, the surgeons and everybody was getting better at everything. Yeah. So, you know, we weren't doing a clinical trial to test the effect of leaving the microbes in. Okay. That could be done next. But in theory, we, you know, we argued that we shouldn't be cleaning the intestines out. Yeah. And the surgeons listened. So... Hopefully that helped. Yep. Yeah, and so in the uh, in the Zimmer article, it was kind of a similar a similar kind of thing, but yeah. it, instead of actual intestinal transplants, it was the just the fecal matter. Just the fecal matter. Um, and you know, it's one you know one sample. Uh, it's entirely possible that that person got better, and so she got better. Yeah. It's entirely possible that she got better for other reasons. Um, you'd have to do a full clinical trial to figure out if that was the reason why someone got better. And in fact, people mm -hmm. are um, not doing full sort of fecal transplants, but many people are now doing full-fledged clinical trials with various microbes being added to their system, you know, so-called mm -hmm. probiotics, mm -hmm. um, to try and figure out if adding those microbes can help in cases of various intestinal diseases, but also various other diseases that we're not sure if they're connected to microbial colonization or not. Hmm. There's a new, part of that article was in essence about this new NIH funded project called the Human Microbiome Project, right. which is a very large NIH cross agency initiative with something like $150 million behind it to start to study, first of all, who is there, what microbes are in people, what are they doing, and then how do they affect health? Yeah. And, the, and, and do you think metagenomics, this kind of uh, the, uh, the genetic sequencing process, getting segments of DNA, the way that they have that, that Venter sequenced the Sargasso Sea to find many individuals, do you think that'll be a large part of this human microbiome? Uh, it, well, it is a large it is part a large of the part. human microbiome project. Mm -hmm. It's unclear um, how much that will be useful as opposed to other techniques. I mean, mm -hmm. I think there always should be a balance in these studies. 
the, the metagenomics is really helpful in giving sort of the baseline. It doesn't really answer any questions, but it gives you the reference information to yeah. then design better experiments. Right. Sort of like the human genome does. I mean, people kind of oversold what the benefits would be from having the human genome sequence. And, you know, it hasn't cured any diseases per se, but there's no doubt that having the genome sequence has accelerated our ability to understand um, diseases and to interpret data. So it, yep. it's sort of a map, not an answer. Right. Um, just one last question. Your take on probiotics in terms of, I mean, <laughs> Activia, yogurt, whatever. I mean, yeah. all this stuff goes through your stomach, which is a highly acidic environment. And how much of it is really going to, like, be good uh, for you? I mean... I'm, I think it's a balance. I mean, I think that there's no doubt that the microbes that live in and on us fundamentally affect our health status. Right. Um, but that doesn't mean that the one strain of microbe that is approved in Activia and all those other probiotics, right. it's basically one organism that is FDA approved and then Lots of people use other organisms that they can't make specific claims about because they're not approved mm -hmm. in yogurts and other things. I mean, I think they, they have enormous potential, but the gut is, you know, again, thousands of species right. and every person has a different genetic and environmental background. So to think that one strain of one species of microbe is going to cure everybody's, you know, health problems is, is you know, clearly not right. But uh, if I, you know, if I get treated with antibiotics, mm -hmm. I definitely am going to try and find some ways to over colonize my system with things that are not pathogenic. <laughs> and maybe not go for a poo transplant. I will not be doing that <laughs> right now. I'd rather eat activity. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Jonathan, it's been wonderful talking with you. Thank you so much for all the information. It's just, um, you know, this is such a complex field and it's, it seems like it's growing more and more complicated by the day. And I, you know, it's great to talk with someone who can break it down. So thank you very much right. for joining me. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Talk to you later. Talk to you later. And this has been Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. If you are interested in any more information, such as uh, what Dr. Eisen has been, has been discussing this afternoon with us, you can find more information. He has a blog at phylogenomics.blogspot.com. And let me see if I can uh, bring that up for you so you can take a look at it really fast. Um, and he also has a Twitter account. And so you can follow him on Twitter if you are interested. Um, his blog is called The Tree of Life. The Tree of Life. Um, I believe, Jonathan, this is a joke post, right? Yeah, that's a joke <laughs> post comparing the science blogs controversy recently with... LeBron James moving basketball teams. Yeah, okay. So he, he scientists have fun too, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so there, there's a lot of information, fun stuff in here related to science, evolution, microbes, um, conferences that Jonathan goes to, thoughts that are on his mind. It's a fascinating, fascinating raid um, if anyone's interested in that. And for some reason, there he is. His Twitter account, Phylogenomics, if you would like to follow Jonathan Eisen on Twitter. And I believe that is about it. That is about it for, um, for me today here on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. We'll be back next week on the This Week in Tech Network for with more science. We always have more science uh, along, coming along. We will be... Um, yeah, I don't know what's happening next week yet. I'm sorry to say I don't have it written down in front of me, so I can't give you a tease. I can just tease, tease to you that it'll be good. It'll be full of science. You'll enjoy it. Um, many thanks for watching. 
And until next week, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Dr. Kiki. I'm on Facebook as well. If you find my fan page, I only, like, I don't friend people unless I meet them and know them in real life. So you can follow me on the fan page if you feel like doing that. Fan me. Uh, additionally, you can find old episodes of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour at twit.tv forward slash Kiki. There's a whole bunch of stuff in there. A whole, almost a year of stuff in the archives. If you need more sciencey goodness, this week in science will be coming up in just a few hours. You can find our website at twis.org, T-W-I-S.org, for uh, that sciencey goodness. And in the meantime, once again, thanks for tuning in. And if nothing else, this hour made your world a whole lot more interesting. 